I'm Julianne DeLynn Hatton, and you're listening to Faith and Reason on the Mormon Faircast. This series will discuss the Prophet Joseph Smith and the authenticity of the gospel he restored. I'll be speaking with Michael R. Ash, author of the book of Faith and Reason, 80 Evidences Supporting the Prophet Joseph Smith. Good evening, Michael Ash. Hi, Julianne. Today in the section of doctrines from your book of Faith and Reason, 80 Evidences Supporting the Prophet Joseph Smith, we are talking about sacred vestments. Sacred vestments, yes. Now, in October of 2014, the church produced a video of LDS Temple garments. Right. Quite honestly, I think it was a surprise to a lot of Latter-day Saints, but I thought it was uh, very well done. And it was, uh, of course, to maybe counter what critics have, you know, referred to. uh, And and Magic underwear is is, uh, one of the most common terms applied to, you know, the sacred garments that Latter-day Saints have. And uh, it it was great to see the church put something together that uh, at least explains the very basic idea, and that it's not magic underwear, that it's not, um, you know, something that uh, can really be viewed as um, occultish, but rather has, you know, very sacred and deep meaning to Latter-day Saints. Do other churches have sacred clothing? Yes, they do. And we see it most typically in some of the uh, churches that have uh, historical ties to the uh, early Christian church, like uh, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, even Judaism. Um, We we see a little bit of in, in Protestantism, but not quite as much. Now, most of the stuff that we see is worn outwardly. So, you know, you have priests that have, you know, robes, and and, and these robes mean different things, mitres, and, and, uh, um, you know, anything from crowns on on down to, you know, Jews had had different, uh, even in in hairstyles and, you know, uh, um, sideburns and and things that would hang off of the the, uh, sleeves or the bottom of the robes. All of these things have symbolic meaning and are used by uh, the religion who has these uh, uh, symbolic vestments to remind them of either covenants or of scriptures or somehow to draw their mind to the sacred. And really, that's not much different than the way LDS view their garments as well. You did quite a bit of research on this topic. Yeah, there's actually surprisingly a lot of information available. Um, you know, we don't discuss these types of things typically outside of the temple, um, even maybe inside the temple, not a lot of it discussed. But there's quite a history of sacred vestments in um, early Judaism as well as Christianity, and in ways that are pretty much uniquely tied to Latter day Saints. Can you give me an example of a sacred vestment? Yeah, it, t- most commonly we see sacred vestments in the form of white uh, robes, um, linen robes that they're described as. And, of course, white is symbolic in many cultures as purity. Uh, It's not stained, and so it's not stained from sin. And we read, again, in some of these uh, early documents that we discussed in, in our last episode about the early Christians, Christ and the apostles and so forth, that the uh, believers, the people that were initiated, the people that were beyond just um, learning about the church, that they wore sacred vestments that had, um, not not only were very white, but but had a, a symbolism that tied them to Christianity and to many times, uh, um, uh, higher teachings as far as, uh, uh, almost as a second person, I guess, is the best way to describe it initially. What are some of the texts that mention these uh, sacred vestments? Everything from the Apocalypse of Adam. Uh, there's actually a lot of them that tie to Adam, and I think we're going to talk about that in a minute. But we have the Odes of Solomon, the Coptic Bartholomew, um, the Book of Enoch, various books of Enoch. And we've, as we mentioned in the past, Book of Enoch is probably the most frequently uh, quoted 
I quote unquote scripture that New Testament writers drew upon. I, if I remember correctly, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 127 times the book of Enoch is either quoted or alluded to uh, by New Testament writers. But yet we don't find the book of Enoch in our modern day scripture. But but the uh, early church obviously viewed it as a very important book in book of scripture. And in that we find uh, um, things about these sacred vestments, the gospel of Philip, the pearl. Uh, so, so there's actually quite a bit of material out there. Once the garment is put on, the word endowment comes into play. Yeah, and an endowment, um, you know, we see it used most frequently as a term like for a gift uh, there, but in ancient times, and actually the, the root of the word uh, means to initiate, to lead, um, and it ties to a Latin word that means to clothe. And so uh, it is a gift, but it's also uh, an investment it's a clothing, uh, and it's a changing of the person. And that's really what's, what's fascinating about reading these early Christian writings, where it talks about putting on the garment like putting on a new persona. Um, when we're baptized as Latter-day Saints, we believe that part of the reason that we're immersed in the water is, is not only that it completely washes away the sins, but also that we're burying our old self. We're, we're buried into... Uh, you know, this grave of water, and we come back up, we're a new person. Um, we've, we've completely changed and, and completely clean. And we take upon ourselves, and we renew this in the sacrament every Sunday, we take upon ourselves the name of Christ. Well, the early Christians believed that by putting on this garment, it was kind of the same thing. It represented putting Christ on ourselves, putting on a new person. Um, and so this garment was representative of of various things, including light and a skin, and of course we think of of skin being a, a new being, and and that tied into the belief that we were putting Christ upon ourselves. What part does the legend of the garment play in the story of Adam and Eve? That's really where it all seems to uh, initially come from the story, because as we read in the Bible that, uh, you know, after the fall, God made coats of skins and clothed Adam and Eve, you know, and it says to cover their nakedness. Well, in, in early Hebrew traditions, uh, there's a lot more going on than just necessarily being clothed with, with uh, coats of skins. It's many times uh, a robe, a white robe, or even clothed by light. Uh, skin and light are, are very close words in Hebrew, and I think used, um, I don't want to say interchangeably, but almost in a wordplay fashion by the Hebrews. Um, and so it was putting on this light, which, which again signified brilliance or maybe a white cloth, and it also signified power. Uh, robes, even in later traditions, you know, kings had robes, again, priests had robes. It's a symbol of, of authority and power. And when Adam took this upon him, it was believed that he had power. And of course, we see that as, as having the priesthood power. And that's what it would have signified. And he received this from God. So he received the power from God, clothed him with the same power. And we read these traditions about uh, uh, Satan was jealous and stirred up the hearts of Adam's enemies um, to try to take this. And, and there's a lot of these legends about uh, people that were trying to fight Adam to take him or that the garment was passed on down through Adam's generations to Enoch and Methuselah and then to Noah. Um, there's some traditions where uh, uh, Ham tried to uh, get this power, uh, Nimrod, uh, Hugh Nibley's written quite a bit about this, is, is fascinating, because he was the king of, of Babel. You know, we read about the, the Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. and um, that's a fascinating story in itself. And like I said, Hugh Nibley's written a lot about this, but the, the tower would have represented a temple, and it's like he was trying to create his own false temple, and false priesthood, and so he wanted this garment from Adam, because that would have given him the power. You know, it's almost like he would have usurped the the priesthood authority of Adam's posterity and, and brought it upon himself. Um, we read, though, that this garment, again, in these various traditions, were passed on down and, and uh, to the righteous leaders and uh, great-grandchildren and so forth of Adam all the way down to Abraham, even. 
and this is all through these Jewish traditions and always representative of, of, of putting on a new person. Uh, and we read even in, in the Bible about how sometimes, you know, um, Jacob became Israel, took upon himself a new name. Well, these things tie into a change in character. We see that even with the popes today. When they become the pope, they take a new name. Um, and, and it has to do with representation of of this has become a new person, and, and there's some authority that goes along with it. So all of these things kind of tie together, and it all started with Adam, which is fitting because he was the first of the, the not only the human race, um, as we understand it uh, from a scriptural point of view, but he was the first of the priesthood race, I guess is one way to describe it. Your book says some ancient Near Eastern texts claim in order for the dead to enter God's presence, they must be properly clothed. Tell me about that. Yeah, according to some of these early um, ancient, again, quasi-scripture, I guess, way to describe it, this uh, robe went along with authority, recognition, um, knowledge, and, and they go hand in hand. And, and, and if, again, if we look back to uh, the early Christian church, the people that were given these robes, and, and sometimes it's followed after baptism, it was given, you know, once they were initiated into the church, once they were ready to move forward, uh, and this represented their their willingness to uh, take Christ upon them and also to receive the knowledge. And so this knowledge was necessary to move forward uh, through the eternities. Um, you, you know, it's interesting because we believe that uh, God is, is really about knowledge, and we are to gain as much knowledge as we possibly can here on this earth in all forms, uh, Heavenly Father tells us in the Doctrine and Covenants. And so the robe represented the, uh, I guess, quest and, and ability to receive this knowledge um, and, of course, it was spiritual knowledge, and, and that would have uh, led us to greater treasures in the hereafter. Fast-forwarding from ancient Christianity, when did Joseph Smith first talk about seeing the temple garment? You know, he, he I'm sure at the time, didn't recognize it. But in hindsight, uh, he probably would have understood it differently. But in uh, 1823 when the angel Moroni came and visited him, and I'll just read uh, quickly these two paragraphs where he describes it. It says, When I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. He had on a loose robe of most exquisite whiteness, it was a whiteness beyond anything earthly I had ever seen, nor do I believe that any earthly thing could be made to appear so exceedingly white and brilliant. His hands were naked, and his arms also a little above the wrist. So also were his feet naked, as were his legs a little above the ankles. So he saw Moroni standing in this heavenly vestment, this robe. And, and, and the tradition uh, states many times with Adam that he got this, this power, this priesthood robe, while on earth, but when he died and went to the heavens, he received yet another brighter robe as well. So, so again, these vestments, um, I guess, in a sense, keep adding um, to show the new position and power. But what's also interesting about this, what uh, Joseph Smith saw, is that Moroni did not have anything on his feet. Well, in um, ancient times, the shoes were the most disgusting things. Sometimes they still are today, uh -huh. uh, you know, it, it, especially back then, because your shoes treaded through everything, you know, and, 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 and back in those days, without the sanitation we have now, it was much worse. And remember that uh, Moses was asked to take off his shoes when he approached uh, the, the burning bush, he said, because this is sacred ground. And of course, we find this again in, even in, in temples all over the world, uh, non-LDS temples, as you take off the shoes. Um, so we find Moroni did not have the shoes on there. He was, it was holy, um, obviously, um, you know, probably did, didn't need him where he was at, but he still needed this robe uh, as an extension of his power and, and priesthood authority. What a fascinating topic from your book of Faith and Reason, 80 Evidences Supporting the Prophet Joseph Smith. Where can we get your book? 
you can get it from uh, fairmormon.org at the bookstore. Um, you can get it from Amazon, um, or you can uh, get it at your local LDS bookstore like Deseret Book, and if they don't have any stock, they can order it for you. And it's not too early to be planning to attend the Fair Mormon Conference in August. Will you be there signing your books? I will be there. I've, I've attended every Fair Mormon Conference with the exception of the, of the first one in California, and it's uh, one of the highlights of my year to, to go and listen to the speakers. Thank you, Michael Ash. Thank you, Julianne. Thanks for listening to Faith and Reason on the Mormon Faircast. I'm your host, Julianne DeLynn Hatton, inviting you to keep the faith. Michael R. Ash is the author of the book, Shaking Faith Syndrome, Strengthening One's Testimony in the Face of Criticism and Doubt, as well as the book of Faith and Reason, 80 Evidences Supporting the Prophet Joseph Smith. Faith and Reason is produced by Tom Hatton with music courtesy of Arthur Hatton. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Fair Mormon or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You can support this podcast by subscribing to it in iTunes and by rating it and writing a review. Questions or comments can be sent to podcast at fairmormon.org or you may join the conversation at fairblog.org.